All right. Good day, everyone, and welcome to Conversations on Retail. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. It is an absolutely beautiful day in Northwest Arkansas. It's going to be a lot more beautiful even in a couple of hours. So excited to welcome Mr. Mike Grain back to continue his uh, community and series focus on on-shelf availability. And today's discussion is with the Dr. Matt Waller from uh, Dean Emeritus from Sam M. Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas. They're going to talk today about the 2024 retail supply chain industry update. Just a few things in the way of housekeeping uh, for those of you that are joining us live, especially this series as as from the beginning is presented by the University of Arkansas, uh, presented by the Walton Supply Chain Center at the University of Arkansas, the number one under uh, undergraduate supply chain program for the second year in a row rated by Gartner. Matt, before you go on, go on, about, mm-hmm. go on. I'm going to mess you up. Um, both Dr. Waller and I have both done, uh, sent, sent some things to LinkedIn about that. The voting for this year's Gardner Th- Award is available now. And, and Matt, I'll give you the link to it later. But anybody who enjoys this content or, or anything we do as part of the University of Arkansas, uh, it would be great if the University of Arkansas supply chain would be number th- thir- third year in a row as the number one undergraduate supply chain program. So a shameless plug, if you do any work with the University of Arkansas and can vote, uh, that is available now. So we would love to have you do that. Appreciate that, Mr. Grain. Also want to thank our sponsors, the folks from BrainCorp, from Fusion, SES Magatag, from Taupin, from Bark Coding, from Williot, and from Symbi Robotics. They've been very, very good to us as partners, and we appreciate them for making this series possible. In case you missed it, Mr. Grain has put up quite the body of work over the last, uh, we were talking about this earlier, almost two years since May of last year. And you can check out all of Mike's past conversations by visiting youtube.com forward slash at conversations on retail. Two other things quickly, this is intended to be a conversation and not a presentation. We would love for you who are joining live to participate, and you can do that by clicking on the Q&A button in Zoom and submitting any questions or comments that you have in writing. Uh, lastly, at the, well, not lastly, second to lastly, it's, uh, it's really important. Michael always like me to mention, we want to be in compliance with all federal antitrust laws. So we're not going to talk about anything related to pricing and margins and discounts and suppliers and and those sorts of things. So just a heads up as you um, as you start to form your, your questions. And then the very, very last thing, the opinions and recommend, recommendations expressed by Mike and his guests are those of their own and not necessarily those of conversations on retail. So make sure that before acting on any of those, you weigh them against the suitability of your own circumstances. So Mike, with the lawyering out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to you and Dr. Waller. Well, Matt, thank you very much. I do appreciate you. Great job you do hosting. Now, What's interesting is you always give us the weather forecast as part of your opening, and we really appreciate that. But as you can see, Dr. Waller is literally in front of a window, and it is a beautiful sunny day in Northwest Arkansas. You didn't have to repeat that. That's just kind of stating the obvious, just so you know. I think that's hilarious. It's supposed to get up to 69 today, I think. Almost 70. That's right. We'll take it. For February, we'll take it. In February. What was it, two weeks ago? Negative two? (laughs) So if you don't like the weather in Northwest Arkansas, just wait. It will change. Uh, also, I did my best. I wore my nice white shirt. I've got a store visit this afternoon, so I kind of figured I'd go ahead and you know dress up for the podcast. And then, of course, Dr. Waller's suit and tie, and he you know, just blows me away with his uh, his, his professionalism. Uh, did you just dress up for us, just for us? We we appreciate it, but you didn't have of to go. Of course. Through. I mean, usually when I see you, Mike, you've you've got a suit on, and I thought <laughs> surely you. would I nor- normally have jeans and a T-shirt, and I didn't want to embarrass you, so. Oh, goodness. Well, let's go ahead and get started, because uh, this is all about on-shelf availability, and we know supply chain um, uh, plays an important role with that. But before that, I, I think most people who are tuning in obviously know you already, but go ahead and you know go ahead and introduce yourself to us. Uh, to the listeners out there, you know, who is Dr. Waller and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'll do it uh, very briefly since we've got a lot of good content to talk about today. Um, so I'm Matt Waller. I'm Dean Emeritus of the Sam and Walton College of Business. I was Dean for eight years. Um, before that, I was an Associate Dean. And before that, I was Department Chair of Supply Chain Management. Um, I also uh, work in uh, private equity to some degree. I work with a private equity firm um, 
called New Road Capital Partners that focuses primarily on supply chain technology, but they also look at uh, retail and marketing technology as well. Um, and uh, I've been a professor um, in the Walton College uh, for a long time. Uh, my area is supply chain management. Um, and I live in Northwest Arkansas. So thank you uh, all for right. joining us. Awesome. Well, here's the first question that I think people would love to know. You just you just finished a very impressive run as the dean of the University of Arkansas Sam Walton Business School. Uh, so thank you for your self, for your service in that. We know that's a that's a very different role than you've had in before, and probably you'll have in the future. But uh, but maybe give us a little bit of experience. You know, a, a look under the covers a little. What was that experience like? What did you really enjoy about it? Uh, anything you want to share with us about you know your time as the dean uh, of the of the business school? Yeah, we uh, during my eight years um, as dean, I, I loved it. Um, I loved working with the students, the faculty, the staff, the alumni, administrators from other colleges, um, the state uh, of Arkansas, uh, businesses in Arkansas. It was a wonderful time. Um, and uh, one thing I did that I'll share that is a little unusual. When I started as dean, I decided to write a book about being a dean of a public business school. And I, you know, part of the reason I did it was because when I became dean, I wasn't expecting to become dean for one thing. And um, we had our current dean at the time uh, had an offer to go back to his alma mater as uh, dean there. And all of a sudden I needed to be interim dean and I really didn't know how to do it. There was no <laughs> handbook or anything like that. Um, but I wrote a book, and I, I want to mention it just because, I mean, most people listening to this wouldn't want to read it. Um, it's called Dean's List, colon, uh, Leading a Modern Business School. But the reason I wrote it is kind of interesting. I thought if I write it, one, it'll help whoever follows me. Um, but two, it will help me think, what do I want the end of the story to be? So, so writing, if I were ever to take another leadership position like this, I would write another book because it forces you to think strategically. Where do mm. I want to go? How am I going to get there? Mm -hmm. It also forced me to, you know, I went around as a new dean. I talked to other deans and, and said, who are, who are the best business school deans in the country? And it's not always correlated to the best school necessarily. You know, who who've been able to really uh, lead these uh, business schools to greater heights? Anyway, and so then I interviewed them and um, really uh, enjoyed um, learning from them and implementing some of the things I learned. And so I put it together in a book and. Now, a lot of especially early stage uh, business school deans call me because uh, when they Google something about it, they find this. And I've also talked about it at some of our conferences, but uh, mm. that was really fun. Um, one other thing I'll mention that's related to to this, uh, as you mentioned, Mike, uh, every two years, Gartner ranks supply chain programs in the country. And I started the Department of Supply Chain Management in 2011. We didn't actually have a department. And uh, in 2020, we got our first ranking of number one by Gartner. And Gartner is probably better than a lot of the rankings because they actually look at details like the curriculum, all kinds of other things. It's not just a beauty contest, if you will, uh, like U.S. News and World Report. Um, so we got that. Uh, they do it every two years. We got it two years in a row, uh, two segments in a row, 20 and 2022. Our master's, our graduate program in supply chain is ranked number two by Gartner. We're trying to get that up to number one. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, um, yeah, being dean was a, a great experience. And um, But uh, I'm glad to be uh, dean emeritus now. <laughs> Very good. Well, one of the things that I'm going to brag on you a little bit, and you're a very humble guy, so you'll hate this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Not only did you run that 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 business school with style and grace and and integrity, et cetera, but you did everything in your power to make sure it was handed off in a quality way. I mean, you 
you personally spent I you, I don't know that this happened but I I feel like you personally handpicked Brent Williams at a very early stage and go okay you're going to walk this with me so you don't just get thrown a set of keys like I did but instead you you get a nice long transition period and the amount of time and effort that you put into making sure this thing was going to continue to grow you know a lot of people don't do that and I just want to thank you for that and Brent's doing a great job off to a tremendous start uh, and a lot of that is because I think you spent the time up front to make sure. I don't know if you know Chip Berg um, from from Adidas. Um, no, I just, I just completely screwed it. Levi's, so sorry, Levi's. Uh, him and I used to work with together with P&G, and they had a one-year CEO transition with the new CEO. One year. Smart. It's unheard of in the industry. It is, yeah. But it's like, we're going to basically do this together for a year, and we'll give you pieces at a time. Um, and I think it's just a really, really, really smart uh, to be able to do that. So so I've got a couple things that we're going to talk about supply chain, because the purpose of this is really to talk about, you know, sort of the supply chain. Um, and, and and we're going to spend some time about the supply chain and certainly as it relates to un, you know, what I would consider to be the topic of this podcast, which is basically on shelf availability. And I put this up here first, Dr. Waller. And this is fascinating to me. Right. So this is Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart. And his quote, it's really simple. If you're not meeting the wants and needs of the customer, you're done. You are done. There's not a lot of loyalty here. And as we've talked, uh, Matt Pfeiffer, several times on the podcast, this thing here ultimately puts the decision of what do I want to get a hold of in the customer's hand. So loyalty is not to a Walmart or to an Amazon, et cetera. It's I want to get that product. How can I get it? And how do I leverage this technology to do this? And, and that's what me is why on shelf availability is so important. While Doug doesn't call that out, if I consistently go to Walmart and my stuff that I'm looking for is not there, I'm going somewhere else. Right. Number two, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, you should probably send this to Brent uh, or Brian at the supply chain, which is this is was at one point in time, I don't know if it still is, on Doug McMillan's screensaver. So every time he opened up his phone, this is what he saw. And it's a story of, you work really hard to become number one. Once you stop becoming number one, it's really hard to recover. You know, 1950, 1960, 1970, Sears is the number one retailer. 2017, they're not even on the list anymore, right? So, you know, that constant, how do we continue to improve even though we're the best? How do we make sure we market and tell people the story? I think is really, really, really important. But to me, these are the kinds of things that I think keep Walmart up at night, which is just making sure they have product either in a store or available for online picking so cu so customers aren't disappointed. Um, one other quick fact that I'll tell you is this is this is something that was done uh, by Tony D'Onofrio, and, and he, he did a lot of research on this, but I'm not going to go through all of this, but one in 2023, $1.7 trillion of inventory disruption. What's that mean? That means your inventory is in inaccurate or you have out of stocks. So 68% of that 1.7 trillion is out of stocks and the other is over stocks, right? That's a big number. That's a big, big number. Then we get into reasons why and et cetera, et cetera. But you, you, what you'll end up seeing is the supply chain plays a big role in on-shelf availability. Th there are three things that I have taught. I try to make it really, really simple. There are three reasons why product's not in the store. Number one, store operations, which means it's in the store somewhere, but it's probably in the back room. So for the customer, it's not available. Number two, the bottom one, we've got this whole perpetual inventory. And, and Dr. Wall, you and I have talked about this a long time, that on-hand accuracy and the accuracy of information to feed a forecast and a replenishment system, garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data that you're sending to the replenishment system, you're probably not going to get really, really good results. So those two, we've we've really talked at, at, at length in this particular podcast, but this is the one I want to focus on today. It's now 2024. Let's talk about the supply chain, because at the end of the day, if there's not product in the store to put on the shelf, everybody says it's a supply chain issue. What really started this, to some degree, were consumer reactions that were odd, like you know hoarding toilet paper and things like that. But but the bigger issue in the supply chain really came from the stimulus of the government. You know, the government put so much money into the economy, and that stimulus is what caused uh, most of the supply chain problems. Some people will say, well, it revealed the problems. 
But I, I don't think that's true uh, completely. Um, part of my reason for that is, you know, you have to rationally run a supply chain to minimize costs and meet service levels. And who would guess that the, the federal government would put that much money into the economy? Uh, they were guessing. And at the same time, the interest rates were really low. And so, um, and so we do still have problems. You know, a lot of times when we talk about, yeah, there were a lot of stockouts during that time frame, but there were also uh, a lot of excess inventory uh, as well, right? You can have two products in the same retail supply chain and have some product that you have too much of and others that you don't have enough of. And still, a lot of retailers and suppliers don't have visibility to their inventory, and that's a key part of the problem. Uh, the other thing I would say is there's two effects that I wanted to mention, um, and one is that um, you know everyone hears about the bullwhip effect, and that was brought up. I don't think it was the biggest problem for uh, the uh, what happened during the pandemic, and the pandemic didn't cause the the problems in the supply chain, the stimulus is what caused most of the problems. But but in any case, um, people, just to clarify, uh, Bullwhip was present and it was part of the problem, but there's a, another concept I'll mention people may not be aware of. But the Bullwhip effect, which does have a lot of, um, people have talked a lot about it, um, and it basically says this, order variability, order variance, in particular, increases as you go up the supply chain. So the variability of orders at the retail supply chain is smaller than the variability at much higher levels, echelons in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So if you start having greater variability at a low level, it gets translated into even greater variability at a high level in the supply chain. However, capacity constraints chop off those peaks, if mm -hmm. you will. And so when you look at a whole supply chain and economy, um, it's not as great as you might expect from a pure theoretical perspective of the bullwhip effect. Mm -hmm. what, what was a bigger cause of some of the problems is something called the inventory acceleration uh, phenomena. And that is, and it's a real simple idea. You know, when demand is real level, it can be uncertain, but you know what the average is over time. You can forecast it really well. You replenish on average at uh, at a one to one level. You know you're not ordering at a one to one level, but your your replenishment is at about a one to one level. You may be ordering case packs instead of uh, eaches, but it's still a one to one kind of an idea. But when demand starts increasing replenishment gets notched up to more than a one-to-one -one level, mm. right? You, you have to be able to, to to have enough safety stock and to take advantage of economies of scale and transportation. So, um, and then, so if, if, you're in, if you're ordering at greater than a one-to-one -one level, the next echelon above you, the distribution center is going to do the same thing and it's going to order at another one to, mm. greater than one-to-one -one level. Mm -hmm. And that will keep happening as you go up the supply chain. So the orders start getting amplified and people aren't aware of uh, necessarily how much they're being amplified and what the implications are if demand decreases. So when demand decreases, the inventory accelerator phenomena would say that instead of ordering the one-to-one -one level, you go to less than one-to-one -one level. Hmm. That happens through the whole supply chain as well. So that can also re result in stockouts. Um, but both of those things did have a part to play in it. Uh, capacity constraints had a part to play. And, um, and then on the demand side, people were, uh, not just people, but even organizations were over-ordering so that they would have enough uh, inventory, uh, maybe more than their competitors. Mm -hmm. So if it's 2018 right now, and we know 2020 is coming, 
what what would what could we have done to minimize we're we're going to have out of stocks right we're not we we with all this years of just in time inventories and trying to drive down inventory levels of various stock the the pandemic created demand both through incentives that you said as well as people just hoarding cleaning for supplies etc what could we have done other than maybe not provided an incentive to drive demand up, which probably compounded com- com- the problem. What could we have done? If we if that happens again, I hope not, but if it happens again in 2026, how do we prevent what we saw in 2020 happening? Are we any smarter than we were before? In some ways, I think we are smarter in, in the sense that, uh, for example, on the transportation side, I think at the store level, I'm not sure. I still think there's a lack of visibility throughout the the supply chain. I mean, at the retail level, across retail. Some retailers have a lot more visibility than others, but you need visibility. You need to know what's going on to be able to respond to it, obviously. You don't want to respond after everything's out of stock, you know. Uh, But I think that, uh, you know, some things that are better is that uh, we have – you know, because more shoppers are using things like buy online, pick up at store, mm-hmm. buy online delivery, buy online in home, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're getting more visibility to consumer behavior. Right. So I think that will help. In the transportation area, you know, there's, there's, um, there are platforms. For example, if you look at truckload transportation, there's platforms out there now like um, um, that uh, there's a company called Emerge and they have a platform that helps kind of marry supply and demand for truckload transportation. Um, there's, um, there's, a, there's a wider variety of technologies, you know, early stage technologies that, uh, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Well, there's all kinds of uh, innovations that have come out of this in the supply chain. Um, but there's also technology out there that existed prior to this, but no one realized they need the, needed them until after it already happened. Right. Um, so those are those are some things that I, I... But in terms of the government, so it depends on... For a government, the government probably overreacted from a stimulus perspective. And a lot of times the stimulus went places that it shouldn't have gone. Mm. And now we have a bunch of debt. And because yep. we have a bunch of debt, the interest rates had to increase. And the interest rates are causing addi- you know, additional problems. Businesses have trouble planning when they don't know what the interest rate's going to be and when they don't know what the prices are going to be. So mm-hmm. you know, from, from a planning perspective um, in a business... Inflation, and that that video you showed really highlighted this, it's very hard to plan and and execute when you're in an inflationary environment. You know, of course, our inflation never was as bad as, say, what they experienced in Argentina or Mm -hmm. somewhere like that. But basically, inflation is always caused by the same thing. Mm -hmm. And people kept saying, okay, the supply chain constraints are causing inflation. Uh, a lot of the empirical research is not showing that. Inflation is caused by government spending, printing money. That yep. is what causes inflation. And in this case, so the government spending caused in uh, stock outs, which caused supply chain problems, which caused inflation. So you had a double whammy mm-hmm. from an inflation perspective. And now interest rates are high. Yep. Uh, when interest rates go up, money people won't put as much money into equities, whether they be in private markets or public markets. Mm-hmm. And equity is what causes innovation to grow. Mm-hmm. And innovation is one of the greatest ways to reduce inflation and to increase wealth uh, of people. Mm-hmm. So I think that you know, if the government were rational and they're not, they would, if they knew it was coming in 2018, they wouldn't have created all these 
maybe some stimulus, but not to the degree they did. And they might try to hold interest rates uh, constant. It's like, if we just know what interest rates are, we can plan. If they're going all over the board, we have no way to plan. Right. And uh, so those are, I think the government could have allowed for a more stable environment is what I would say. But we also need to be investing. The government needs to be investing instead of just stimulus handouts to people. They need to be investing in infrastructure. We have bridges that are uh, dilapidated. Yeah. Uh, our electric grid, uh, something like 50% of our electric grid is over its expected life. Wow. Our, our electric grid's a big problem. Um, we need lots of investment in the electric grid and mm. other things. Interesting. So they could have potentially repurposed that money that they were going to give to instead to drive demand, which probably already was there's some demand there, instead of in, in to invest in the infrastructure to support what we need to do. Yeah. You, you mentioned something a second ago about, so let's forget about the global pandemic, because that was that was in the past. We've learned a lot of stuff. You you mentioned the bullwhip effect, uh, and, and I lots of people on the line have already heard bullwhip effect and heard that forever. But it's basically demand at the consumption level is pretty flat, and in every stage, the logistics coming more and more and more and more. We've been talking about the bullwhip effect. I remember when I was in college, we talked about the bullwhip effect. Have we fundamentally flattened out that bullwhip effect? And if not. What are some of the either processes or capabilities need to put in place? Because to me, having visibility of all items in the supply chain, across the supply chain, so manufacturers knew exactly what was in the stores and exactly what were in the retailer DCs and exactly in their DCs, it certainly wouldn't have helped the global pandemic because there was just too much demand. But we still have these little pockets. Everybody knows where their stuff is, but nobody knows end to end where stuff is located. Is that an opportunity for the industry to to figure this thing out? Because we've been talking about the bullwhip forever. Yeah, so the bullwhip effect can be mitigated through information. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. Um, but even problems associated with what I mentioned earlier, the inventory acceleration effect, mm -hmm. that can also be mitigated with um, more information about product mm -hmm. position, um, uh, where, you know, uh, frequency, uh, rate of demand, all these kind of things. So, but you've got to be able to take that information and plan with it too. It's not enough to just have the information. Right. You've got to be able to make plans uh, with it. Um, so, yeah, I think that right now there's still surprisingly a lack of, av of availability of information. And the more information we have, the easier it will be to plan. Um, but if we were to get that information, these companies are gonna need tools to be able to plan uh, with this information. Right, right. Yeah, not not to talk us all the way through the, the end of the story, but you know, my 40 years in the industry, the way we transfer information from one entity to another is typically using electronic data interchange, which been a technology has been around for 50 years, right? Yeah. With the massive amount of information that's now out there, that's a lot more information than I think is suitable for that kind of transactional platform. There was a lot of talk probably a couple of years ago, it started to tailored off a little bit about this idea of a blockchain where everybody had insights where is that really, really? And, and by, by the way, I'm probably catching you off guard because I don't think we talked about this question ahead no, of time. Blockchain, blockchain to me was kind of the epitome. It was going to be able to share information privately and you'd know everything in the supply chain, et cetera. And you don't hear that much about it anymore. I, I believe, well, if you think about it, right, back in the 90s when the internet's been around a long time. Right. But when the World Wide Web came out in the 90s, and at first, it was just pushing information, right? And then eventually, you got to the point where you could order things, and buy things, and make transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, PayPal came out, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there was a time, if you remember, at the end of the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, everyone said, oh, this was all hype. 
people thought that e-commerce was hype mm -hmm. until, I mean, for a, over a decade past then. Right. Right. I think the same thing's true with blockchain. I am still very bullish on blockchain. Right. I believe that one of the challenges with with um, blockchain right now has to do with visibility and uh, knowing when product is moved around. You can't have, uh, the blockchain doesn't work as well if there's manual entry of information. Mm -hmm. So if you're using technologies like RFID as an example, and more broadly in the supply chain, where you know movement can be uh, captured immediately, then smart contracts can be written based on that movement and executed. I still think this is coming. Yeah. This, this will happen. I don't yeah. know if it's going to take five years or 20 years, but I know this. All technology implementation is increasing. And what I mean by that is what used to take 30 years to be introduced has continued to, to decrease in time. Right. But I'm still very bullish on blockchain. Okay. Uh, well, I, and I think the other thing that's that's coming along, and I don't want to derail this conversation, but um, I know I've talked this on a podcast with GS1 as well as with Myron Burke, you know, last month, the whole idea of serialized data. So I've got, you know, two pens. They both have the same UPC, but this one's serial number one and this one's serial number two. It's foundational in RFID. That gives me the ability to know this one sold and this one did not sell. Uh, it's just... Really, really, really powerful. It has all kinds of asset protection use cases as well. You know, what did I receive versus what did I pay for? Because I can literally identify each one of these uniquely. I, I think as I've talked to people like, you know, Justin Patton from Auburn and, and Dr. Hargrave from the University of Memphis, we still struggle with most legacy systems inside a retail and manufacturer is still UPC quantity. So how do you get down to that next level? That's going to be the big challenge. And blockchain may be, an example of that, EPCIS, which is an RFID plat data sharing platform, may be it. We're going to have to figure out this out because it feels like we're still running into the same problems over and over again. Um, and, and I do know that, you know, when we did the Auburn study, the chip project, if you will, multiple billions of dollars of claims and shrinkages and you know, counterfeit product, it's still a problem out there in the industry. And we still haven't figured out a way to solve that. Uh, we really need some industry leadership to kind of help figure out what that future looks like for sure. So good. If you're still bullish on blockchain, because just personally, I've, it was a whole bunch of excitement a couple of years ago and now it's kind of bittered away. So hopefully people are still looking at that because you, you know, I think it's a real mechanism. Uh, Warren Buffett, um, he's, one of his famous quotes is, when everyone's greedy, be cautious. Uh, everyone's cautious, be greedy. Ooh, I, good. I think that that's true uh, right now um, with blockchain technologies. Interesting. And, like and with RFID and other kinds of technologies. Internet of Things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, may, maybe, tra maybe transition. And by the way, just a reminder for our, any of our uh, attendees, if you have a question uh, that you would like to ask, then please let me know. We've got some other questions I've got structured here, but... You're more than welcome to throw a question in the chat if you'd like me uh, to answer it. And if we can get to it, we certainly will. Uh, talk about, you know, the whole idea of on-shelf availability. You mentioned buy online, pick up in store. You mentioned uh, Dr. Hargrave is, is a big one on uh, Ropus, which is research online pick up in store. So people literally getting online and going, does that store have it? Does that have a story? Well, oh, that one has it. I'll go to that one, right? And being able to have enough confidence you're on hands to do that. But talk to me about the on-shelf availability, the implications of the supply chain. Because if the store doesn't have it, you can't sell it. There's, there's no way to sell it. So forget about the stuff happens inside the store. What are the what are the opportunities that you see in terms of uh, the the role that supply chain will play in the future for making sure products available for the for the customer? Okay, I will do that. I, I would also like to talk about the store at some point. Um, yep, absolutely. You can um, but so when you look at the supply chain, um, there's so many variables that affect on stock, in stock at the store. Okay. Everyone jumps to transportation, and I'll talk about that. But 
there's a lot of others. For example, case pack quantity. Mm-hmm. Okay. You look at how do how do suppliers make case pack quantity decisions? Well, how many will fit on the shelf? I mean, fit in the on the pallet. Um, how can we cube out the truck? Um, what what can our packaging equipment do? This mm-hmm. is how case pack quantity decisions are made. Mm-hmm. But in reality, case pack often becomes the de facto store level replenishment quantity. Right. Not always because you sometimes have inner packs and sometimes they do replenish in each. But many times the case pack becomes the multiple of uh, order quantity at the store level. And I won't get into it right now. That has a huge impact. I've done I've done studies on this. Mm. Mm. It has a huge impact on in stock and inventory levels in the store. So you have a disconnect. I'm going to use this just as an example. You have a disconnect between uh, a variable that really has a big impact on store level efficiency and how those decisions are made. Totally disconnected. Hmm. Great point. Uh, yep. But you, you can find those kinds of examples all over the place. Um, another another example uh, in transportation, you know, um, you take something like intermodal. A lot of shippers don't want to use intermodal because the lead time is longer. In some cases, the lead time variability is longer, or I should say the lead time uncertainty is higher. Uh, longer lead times, higher, longer lead times and higher uncertainty in lead time leads to either more safety stock being required or more stock outs or both. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so, uh, but if you look at intermodal, the price is a lot lower. I mean, the freight rates are much better, especially on long, longer hauls. Now, on short hauls, that's not true, but on longer hauls, that's true. Um, but a lot of times they're not, and, and yes, it is true. You could, you might have to hold more safety stock, possibly. Right. Uh, that's not always a certainty. Um, but maybe the cost difference is worth it, especially when you're in a situation where you have um, inflation. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe maybe instead of making the uh, quantity and the and the uh, package smaller, like giving making it 10 ounces instead of 12 ounces for cereal or something like that. Maybe we just need to switch to intermodal. Just to, This is just one simple example. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, you mentioned you want to talk a little bit about the store. So let's go there. Um, mm-hmm. let, let's take that example you just said. Most retailers will actually set their shelf holding capacity based upon the case pack. Right, not based upon what sells, but for example, I'm going to set this up so I know. Let's say the case pack is 12. Well, I'm going to set my case pack to 18 and to my shelf capacity to 18 because I want a full case to fit on the shelf, and I want to be able to run down to six before I order the next one and deliver it, so the whole thing fits on the shelf. That's utopia, right? But is that the right level of shelf capacity for that item? Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't justify holding 18, but that's what you set it at because it's a case in a pack and a half. So that is certainly one issue. Um, there are obviously other reasons as well. So you said you wanted to me- you mentioned the store. Go ahead and you know give us your thoughts on what the store level implications of this are. Yeah. So so for one thing, um, I mean, right, if if a supplier increases the case pack quantity, their sales to the retailer will increase for a time. Yeah. Right. Because it, it will have to um, fill up the uh, prime the pump, if you will. And um, and so as the pump's being primed, um, you're going to see an increase in sales from the supplier's perspective, not from the retailer's perspective mm-hmm. necessarily. Mm-hmm. You might, if the product is a um, impulse item, you know, with impulse items, there is a relationship between demand and inventory level. The more you have, the more you sell. But 
For most items, you don't see that. And you take something like Similac, it's it's a destination item. It's not an impulse item. Many items in the store aren't. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, um, if you look at different products by day of the week, um, some products sell more on the weekend or certain days of the week because of various reasons. And um, if you're setting your facings simply based on the case pack quantity, um, you might run out of some products on Saturday morning or Saturday by noon, where if you would have um, adjusted your, your shelf quantity to meet peak demand, you wouldn't be out of stock of that item. And you, know, you also have to remember, most items in the store are fairly slow movers. In right. Any store. Yeah. You know, there's a few items that move like crazy, right? So, so for the ones that move really fast, it would be optimal from a store perspective to allocate more shelf space yep. uh, to them. Um, and uh, having bigger case back quantities don't make sense. I mean, it might make sense. Right. But, but for slower moving items, like you, you take certain kinds of shampoo, uh, which I never buy anymore. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and you take certain, you know, you see, I don't know how many SKUs are in a typical uh, store, but hundreds. He's like, what's hundreds. that? Hundreds. Yeah, it's there's a lot of SKUs of of, yeah. of, of uh, shampoo. And you you may need them for various reasons, uh, so you don't lose shoppers. But you don't need a big case pack, right? right. You know, you, you probably don't need more than one facing for those SKUs. Yep. Yep. Um, the other problem with having large case pack quantities at some point when they get too big is if all the product doesn't fit on the shelf, then the case has to go back to the back room yep. and it often gets lost. And that's one of the benefits of, of RFID or a technology like that is that if they, these retailers were using it properly, um, they would know where product is in the store. And the case pack quantity wouldn't be as big of a deal, but it still is. Even if you have RFID and you're using it properly, if your case pack's too big, then you're going to have multiple trips from the back room to the to the shelf, and and then that increases your labor costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Brian uh, just sent us, Brian Grove just sent us a note. I, I'd love to have you kind of uh, react to this. He says, in my honest opinion, longer lead times aren't an issue if service is consistent and you have a regular cadence of order generation, say, once a week. Processes like dynamic distribution that delays the final score allocation to account for the point of sale forecast and variability. Agree I or do you want to have a little debate? Um, I, I will agree and uh, disagree to some point. <laughs> Good. I do agree. If if demand is level, yep. meaning, and then you're going to have good service, I totally agree. Okay. Um, absolutely. Yep. As, yep. as uncertainty starts increasing, um, at some point, the longer lead times will have to result in more safety stock because, mm. uh, you know, safety stock... Um, is a rough estimate. It's about equal to the, the amount of safety stock increase you have to use is about equal to the square root of the lead time. So it increases, but kind of at a decreasing rate. That's just a rough um, mm -hmm. estimate. But yep. I do agree. If you if you have things, if you have good service, mean your uh, your ship your carriers are consistent providing good service and your demand isn't too uncertain, uh, then yeah, you should be able to plan this. Yeah. It's a planning problem. So I agree with Brian. Yeah. I, th I think there's a couple more factors too, and I'm, I'm not sure this is an official industry term, but the term as I use a, a lot is switchability. Okay. So if I'm going in to the store for bread and they don't have exactly the bread I'm looking for, I'm leaving the store with bread, right? I'm not going to go home. Oh, sorry, I didn't have bread. They didn't have any bread. Oh, they had four of the loaves, but I want, you said you wanted this one. Well, buy another one. That's different 
that if I'm going in to buy a black printer cartridge for my HP printer and they have other printer cartridges, I can't switch. I got to find this one. And I think that's why you're finding RFID really taking off in the apparel and general merchandise, probably more so than dry grocery for that reason, because you know, we've we've battled this and you know this, we've battled this. We need to provide more assortment and opportunity for merchandise for for our customers. And that's on one end of the pendulum and then it swings all the way back. No, we need more holding capacity because we're running out of stock. And that game, that game has been gone in probably since the first retail store, which is how do I offer the right level of assortment while maintaining my my on shelf availability for my customers? That's always a pendulum that goes back and forth like amongst retailers. And I'm not sure that merchants who make those decisions are really thinking about it in that way about the supply chain implications. I think they're more about a I need to offer more assortment to my customers, or I'm I'm hearing a lot of problems with out of stocks of the shelves. How, how do we factor in really experts in the supply chain to these decisions that are being made? between a buyer and a, and a seller. Um, let's get back to your switching concept. Okay. Uh, you're, you're right. Um, you know, it's like if you, if you want um, buttermilk biscuits and you go in there out and they have country biscuits, you might be okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, if you're uh, a new parent, you've got a baby and you go in for, Enfamil, because that's what maybe they gave you in the You're not switching. hospital. You're not you switching. You get in there and it's <laughs> um, it's not available. You don't sl- switch to Similac because a lot of times, or vice versa, not uh, right. names of the brands are irrelevant. Right. right. Uh, the point is that people aren't going to switch. Great point. Yeah. Very few people will. And you not only lose the basket, you lose. Um, you could lose the customer in some cases if if it happens too often. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, and and the jo- running joke I do is if you're in a Walmart store and you don't have your stuff, I'm going to go back to what we said. The customer is ultimately in control. They're going to get out their phone, and they're going to use Walmart Wi-Fi to order it from one of the competitors. Now, how about that for a double slap in the face? But it, they're going to make their choices because the customer is ultimately go back to the first thing we said. The Doug said. You know, there's not a lot of loyalty there. If they they're going to get that they want, and if you don't give it to them, they'll find somebody who will. No problem. Yeah. Um, so Michael Heinkel just gave me an interesting question. Seems like item velocity and the modular holding power may have a bigger impact at the shelf versus supply chain issues, especially with the shelf used for physical customer and digital customer. Your reaction to that? I totally agree. Okay. Um, I. I- I mean, we're always talking about transportation and warehousing, but the reality is the store is the place where you've got to get supply chain concepts integrated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I definitely agree. And I don't think think, um, many retailers, you mentioned this earlier indirectly, but are in their merchandising decisions are really taking into account the supply chain variables. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, it, it's true, um, holding capacity, um, even store processes, you know, which have to be enabled by technology these days. They've got to be. Yeah. And, um, and then visibility. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that a lot of times retailers look at merchandising as a and art. So if you if you look at omnichannel, for example, well, let me back up a second. If you look at um, retail media networks, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. This industry was about forty billion in twenty twenty three, according to some numbers I have. Maybe it's not perfectly accurate, but that's roughly. And you know, it's still nascent, right? It's still a nascent form of media. But if you draw a straight line, it looks like it could be as much as by 2026, 180 billion. Wow. Okay. And many suppliers out there don't know. Oh, there's 600 retail media networks out there. You know, Walmart Connect is one of the, uh, an example. Yep. If you look yep. at Walmart Connect, right? You can you can advertise if you're a supplier. You can advertise on their um, digital. Uh, space, you know, like um, 
You can advertise on the app. You can advertise on the website. You can have a, a sponsored pay. Uh, you can have a, a brand page. There's all these different ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. Even in the store, you know, you've got audio, you've got video, you've got even at the self check stand. You know, there's a place where they advertise things yeah. right there. Sure do. Um, but on top of that, they have partnered with um, a company to create a way where you can actually, as a supplier, also advertise on Walmart's um, social media like uh, Instagram or Facebook, things like that. Yep. And so, um, and so, what's happening is suppliers are. I, I'm surprised how many suppliers really still aren't very familiar with this. But like, how do they increase more spend? Do they take spend from their other media that they used to use and put more of it into retail media networks? This is going to have a big impact on demand, where demand comes from. And I think that merchants and suppliers need to be thinking a lot more about how do we incorporate this. This information is quite available. Right. How do you incorporate that into your forecast and into your supply chain planning, your network design? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's happening uh, very much at this point. And it's it's gonna it's gonna get bigger. It's gonna have more and more uh, impact uh, over time. Yeah, for sure. Well, what do you think the big? So it's so it's now twenty twenty four. I mean, what are the big? What are the big opportunities in the retail supply chain? I'm not gonna say just supply chain. What are the big opportunities in your point of view in the in the retail supply chain? What are the things that we should be focused on? We need to be focused on omni-channel. We could have a whole conversation about that, but if if you if you're if you have a store and you have all the omni-channel options and it doesn't increase sales, then all you've done is increased uncertainty mm. for every SKU. Okay. If it increases sales, you might have actually solved some problems um, through that, um, ignoring capacity constraints and things like that. But um, but I really think understanding how the network designs need to change as a result of um, omni-channel is a huge opportunity uh, that is being under. And right now, you know, people are saying, well, we need to change our network design a little bit or we need to do this, that, or the other, maybe case back quantities. I don't even know all these variables. But I think there's a lack of really using concepts that are well-established in supply chain management and applying them um, to these kinds of questions uh, for omnichannel and, 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 of course, retail media networks. Everyone in supply chain should be aware of retail media networks and be learning as much about them as possible. Yep. And then how your company's responding uh, to these things. But but the, the other thing is, you know, Mike, I, I remember if you would have asked me back in 2005, would technology like RFID as an example be implemented and be being used by this point? I would have said, of course, by this point. Visibility is so important. And now that we have blockchain technology, the marginal benefit of visibility has gone up an order of magnitude mm -hmm. from a supply chain perspective. Right. So I think it's going to take leadership from key players yep. to roll this out and make this work. Yep. Well, and just to just to build on that, and then we're we're going to kind of wrap this up. You know, I've spent 20 years in RFID. I've I've started up and shut down more RFID projects than I care to remember, but it's now taken place, right? Every major retailer is using it, but I would say 90% of the benefits today in retail are at the store. It, yeah. It's getting, you know, as Dr. Harger, it's getting to the on-hand accuracy of knowing what you have and where it's located. The opportunity, since all of this stuff, for the most part, is tagged at source by the manufacturer, tracking it through the supply chain and eliminating claims and duplication and product authentication, et cetera, are the big opportunities. And I think that's where RFID and blockchain will play. It's just really, really hard. I mean, the people, practitioners who are trying to do this, they're always challenged with that kind of thing. But we're, we're going to get there. And I agree with you. I think 
knowing what you have and where is it located throughout the entire supply chain and the impact of omnichannel are clearly going to be big drivers for this. I even think from a defense perspective. Yeah, I think so this too. This kind of thing can thwart uh, terrorist behavior and so forth. Yeah, uh, well outside of retail for sure. Um, Dr. Waller, what did I, what did I, and we've got, we're a little bit over, but that's okay. What did I not ask you that I should have? What's on your mind? What's keeping you up at night? You know, what are the things that you think we ought to be thinking about as an industry? Well, um, I, I think as an industry, and I'm talking broadly supply chain, uh, management, not just retail. Yep. Yep. We need to be, uh, f really thinking about, um, making sure that we have multiple ways to ship things, to store things, to forecast, uh, because other big uh, sources of uncertainty are heading our way. We just don't know what they are. There's other black swans out there. Got it. Got it. Cool. Dr. Waller, as always, thank you so much. Thank you for all you do for the industry. Uh, thank you for your leadership uh, at the University of Arkansas. Uh, this will this has this is the first time we've talked. It won't be the last time we've talked. I, I, I enjoy working with you on these kind of things, and and uh, certainly we'll put your your bio information in the uh, in the podcast so if anybody wants to reach out to you separately. But thank you so much. Have a have a great rest of your day, and I really do appreciate you joining us today. It was absolutely my pleasure. I always enjoy visiting with you, and your um, background is so remarkable being the first information systems type person on a supply chain a supplier team here in uh northwest arkansas and just all the things you've witnessed and you're continuing to stay involved so thank you uh, yep. for having me good talking to you all right have a great rest of your day thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.